Greetings, and a warm welcome to our weekly roundup. Whether you're enjoying quality time with friends or simply seeking a delightful backdrop for your activities, this video is perfect for you. But wait, there's more. Make sure to click that subscribe button to stay in the loop with our freshest content updates. We've got a treasure trove of exciting videos waiting just for you. Don't miss out on the adventure. What's the worst physical pain you ever felt? Story 1. Pylonidal cyst right on your tailbone from snowboarding and then having to sit on a four-hour flight. Doesn't sound like much, but if you've had one, sitting upright was hell. Hopefully some useful info for those who have had this reoccurring. There is a surgical option with greater than 85% efficacy of non-recurrence if you can get your insurance to cover it. After years of dealing with recurrence and more than a dozen ER visits, I finally convinced the insurance that it was worth it to them. Try to find a local specialist. The doc I went with was very highly rated, but has since retired and passed on. He performed my surgery a few days after turning 73, so I guess that shouldn't have been too surprising. Pre-surgery is the time to look into liquid diet, as you will not want to have much of anything in your colon for a few weeks. I wasn't given this advice, so somewhere in the history of my post replies, I got into graphic detail of the horrors of a post-surgical dump that put me back into the hospital the day after surgery. You'll be scrubbing down multiple times a day with povidone iodine and or chlorhexidine scrub. Day of, you'll get full sedation for a flap surgery. Not to get too graphic, but pilonidal cysts occur mostly usually around the sweat glands and hair follicles, when you have multiple hair follicles in clusters. This happens most often in the perineum above the anus. This is the area that gets flapped, with the section of skin and upper fatty tissues excised, then the flaps of skin pulled tight and stitched. You'll be immobile for a few days, whether you like it or not. The stitches holding the flaps together will make you regret trying to get up, move, bend, roll over, or play unalive. There will be many stitches and they will hold secure. It's not an easy recovery and they don't or won't use dissolvable t sutures. The good news, after about two or three weeks, you'll be able to have the stitches out and post-surgical follow-up should be positive. 15 years and counting. I have had the scar tissue from the sutures cause me a scare or three, but besides that, have had zero reoccurrence. Best of luck, pilo sufferers. This happened to me when I was 18 years old. I attempted to ignore it for a week, and it got so bad that I could not sit down. Idiot teenagers move right here. I believe it came from a tailbone injury much, much earlier in life. I'll never forget the day I got it lanced. The doctor needed to numb the area before he lanced it. There I was laying on my stomach at the exam table with my butt exposed to the world. The doctor tells me he's about to apply the LN2 spray and boy did he do that very liberally. So much so that it dripped down the back of my orbs and felt like someone stabbed my nuts with an ice pick. Still, the cyst was some of the worst pain I've ever been in and then... The constant packing of the gauze daily that my poor, poor neighbor who was a nurse offered to do for me. Now, if that's not neighborly, I don't know what is. Do any of you ever look up any zit-popping videos? Even if you're used to those, do not look up this kind of cyst, the pilonidal cyst. Nope, no. You'll also come across the surgical video of it, and that's horror show right there. Story 2. Trigeminal neuralgia. I hope I said that right. Excruciating stabbing pains triggered by any and everything. You can't touch your face, brush your teeth, eat, kiss, lay on your side, nothing involving your mouth. It's like a relentless ice pick stabbing you or a million electric shocks. Sooner or later, you'll want to expire. That's why they call it self-unaliving disease. I went way too far to see this. Hello, fellow sufferers. I was on 3,600 milligrams of gabapentin at my peak, and it fracking sucked. What are your triggers? Mine was cold. 
I was an American expat living in England when I was diagnosed, and we luckily moved back to the South, and I was able to wean all the, all the was off, and while I still have minor attacks, I wear a dental splint 24 hours a day. I still clench and break my teeth. I don't get them nearly as often. It's so isolating because people just don't understand why you can't do anything but lay there and not move until the pain stops, and that narcotics don't help, and you don't want to be touched. You can't talk. You can't move, you can't think, you can't anything. And I have other chronic illness and have given birth three times, had gall and kidney stones, have a bulging and perforated disc in my L5-S1, have RA. I break teeth easily when I clench due to the stress of a physical intimate violation from my time in the military. Oof. So that leads to infections migraines that are currently being treated with multiple medications and injections, and when I get a TN attack, it is the worst pain. Holy frack, I've been through nothing in my life. May your pain end. N not an unaliving threat. <laughs> I wouldn't take it as an unaliving threat, and I appreciate your well wishes. I like to reflect on it the same way my mother told us about her RA diagnosis. I won't expire from it, but I will expire with it. So while sometimes everything piles up on me and I feel like I want to expire, I know it will get better and I just have to hang on. Nothing I have is fatal in any combination, so I hopefully have time to be here for my three kiddos and husband. I'm a veteran, so dark humor and stubbornness will get me through many years. If date or destiny or whatever you want to call it deems fit, and I'm a firm believer in being my brother's-slash-sister's keeper and being a lifeline to others that I share burdens-slash-joys with, such as others with TN or RA or other stuff. Fortunately, mine's in remission right now, but the worst is trying to brush my teeth or eat. Or is it trying to sleep? Such fun. My pharmaceutical cocktail has it so I don't scream most of the time anymore. My answer also truly and easily the worst experience of my entire life, and there is so little that can be done. I called the out-of-hours doctors once because I was honestly worried I'd just unalive myself. I was lectured about the service being primarily for cancer patients and accused of having sniffed solvents. The doctors could only throw stronger and stronger pain meds my way, which weren't ideal as I was a single mom to a seven-year-old at the time. Ended up with a bit of Teflon in my brain to separate the collapsed blood vessel and the nerve that was causing the entire smeg show. If you ever forget something, just tell people your thoughts are non-stick. Glad you're feeling better. I only had one time a tooth in the back of my mouth cracked and I was feeling severe pain and it came in waves, not nearly as bad as this. Nothing nearly as bad. I only felt maybe a fraction of that pain where I just had to sit down and wasn't able to do anything until I could finally get to the dentist. Story three. Sneezed and herniated a disc in my back. Couldn't walk for five days. This was almost two months ago and I can still barely stand for longer than five minutes at a time. Edit to add. After reading some of the replies to my comments, I am one of the lucky ones, apparently. I feel bad for all of you, and sorry, but I hope I don't have this problem as long as all of you have. My dad herniated two discs while we were hiking in the Boundary Waters, the most pain I've ever seen someone experience. He had to get flown out by helicopter. I herniated three discs simultaneously in December 2021. I had to be rushed screaming to the ER. Almost two years later, I still have nerve pain through my back and down my leg, and my daily life is still impacted by it. I have three herniated discs, too. It's been over eight years, and it sucks. The worst part of a herniated disc injury is that, by all appearances, you look normal. Like you should be able to just go snowboarding, wakeboarding, whatever, with the crew. Or help someone move. Or lift that randomly heavy thing. Or do whatever. And you can't. And people try not to judge you, but you know they judge you. I've been called old man more times than I can count, and it fracking hurts as bad as the back pain every time I hear that. 
Like, I'd rather have this than paralysis or missing limbs, and my heart goes out to those that have that. It's worse than this. But something very few understand is the mental anguish with knowing you can almost do activities that your peers are doing, but not quite. And that people judge you for it. Edit. Can't respond to everyone. Well, I could, but then I'd only be using this site and not doing other things. <laughs> Just know that I'm reading it all. Y'all are awesome, and I'm sorry you're going through something similar, and oftentimes much worse. I can say that if you can actually get up and walk, do so. Walk as many steps as your body will allow. Get a route that gives you a certain number of known steps and start doing that route every day. Then go further and or do it multiple times. Walking is so huge for many issues like this. Stretching and strengthening your core slash glutes come next if you can manage that. My QOL has gotten so much better in the span of about two to three months after taking this all more seriously and getting out and actually walking and counting my steps. Stop sitting, start standing, walk when you can, stretch, strengthen. Good luck, everyone. I'm rooting for you. Reach out if you need help with motivation or just someone to talk to. You explained it perfectly, 100% accurate. I was in the car accident that caused it when I was 29, so relatively young. When I'm in public, my wife has to lift the water cases onto or off the shopping cart, and I get dirty looks from people expecting me to do it because I'm young and a man. Then they see me limp away and their facial expressions change. That does really suck that people judge you for it. I have been fortunate in my life that I've never had anything like this, and I do walk. Or, or use an exercycle or do something every day to try to keep it up. And hopefully I never run across anything like this in my life, but I just could not imagine how my life would change if something like this happened to me. What is not a religion, but people treat it with the same attention? Story 1. Obsession with a famous person or persons. Edit. For the people who are saying that it may have been the fake pic that someone else did, I did a little digging and found the picture she showed me again. It's the one on this article. I have a coworker who is obsessed with Harry Styles. She thought I was crazy for not knowing what tattoos he has because I'm a tattoo person. And she once was telling me about how hot he looks in the most recent picture of him released. She proceeded to show me the picture and he was wearing a mask and sunglasses in it, so you couldn't even really see his face. And she was drooling over it. Mind you, this isn't some teenager I work with. She's 31. I can't stand people whose mind only goes one direction. <laughs> you just put years of frustration into words which I couldn't think of, and it's a freaking joke. I love you. This sounds like a person I know. For some reason, she became obsessed with Harry Styles late last year and just posts non-stop about him on her social media. I nearly went out with her in 2020, but it didn't work out. Long story, honestly. I was sad, but that feeling quickly dissipated when I saw how obsessed she became. Especially when it goes to the point of somehow thinking it's okay to commit violence against that celebrity. We all know about Christina Grimmie. But how about Japanese pop idols? Mayu Tomita, who was stabbed dozens of times for not accepting a fan's gift? Ena Matsuoko, who was stalked and physically violated in front of her own home? Two AKB48 members were attacked with a saw, yes, a handsaw, at a meet-and-greet event. Another NGT48 sister group of AKB48 member Maho Yamaguchi was forced by her management to apologize for causing a disturbance to her fans when she was the one attacked by two stalkers outside her own home. The details of this is just downright disgusting. And on and on. Didn't want to use Wikilinks as references, but too many news sites need to register. A few months ago, I saw Olivia Wilde while trending. I thought, Oh, she's hot, and I loved her in-house. I wonder why she's trending. And clicked. Never again. The guy she's dating has an absolutely bloodthirsty fan base. 
who fracking hate everything she does. It's seriously disturbing what some of them put out. Yeah, they are nuts. So many fans can't handle the celebrity being in a relationship. So many female partners are accused of faking babies and human trafficking, all to either imagine the guy single or in a gay relationship with an ex-coworker they haven't seen in years. I once knew a guy who was like that about an A-list movie star, and he was depressed for days when she went out with a boyfriend. He was genuinely mad. So weird how people get attached to a public persona. Parasocial interaction. Basically, our brains don't understand that a person we see all the time isn't someone that we can interact with. Our brains are very caveman when it comes to social interactions. We're very, very wired to believe that we're part of a smallish group without whom we will not survive. When you think of it that way, a lot of human behavior starts making a lot of sense. I feel like stan culture has become insane. Years ago, it was said as a meme slash joke, but really meant that you were just a big fan of an artist and knew a lot of facts and details about them in relation to their music or craft. Now, stan culture is more akin to the actual stan in the M song. People are creepily obsessed with celebrities, and sure, that type has always been around, but how they spam reply fan videos and poop on socials and have multiple accounts dedicated to an artist is just strange. Stan culture is not stronger now than before. Or it's now stronger now than before. When's the last time you saw a guy try to unalive a president because he believed it would get the attention of a famous actress? Look at the generations of Beatlemania. Or maybe it was not at the beginning. Look at the generation of Beatlemania. Didn't some chick attempt to mail herself to the Beatles? I'm kind of on the fence about this. I think a lot of things have been amplified by social media, but obsession with celebrity has been around for quite a long time, even before Beatlemania. I know there's always been parents reacting to kids just going nuts over some artist or movie star and wondering what the deal is. Story 2. Disney. Especially when you go down to Florida. You have no clue the power that cartoon mouse has. I'll never forget the story about a cast member who played Goofy who was told, These two kids just saw their parents perish in a car crash. One or both were beheaded from the crash, and their kids saw it. We let them see the nightly Disney parade, and we're trying to get the Grand Marshal Mickey to meet specially with them. I don't remember the backstory on why they were at Disney. I think they were waiting for a family member or something, where they literally lost all they had and were waiting to figure out what to do with them. Kids were not injured at all. Guy who did what he could as Goofy to cheer them up, but they were still in shock. He said he had to leave for a bit, pull off his mask, and just start sobbing. Anyway, Mickey finally shows up, and I kid you not, the kids' faces lit up in excitement and happiness. That's the power of the mouse. Nowhere near as traumatic, like, holy hell, but I beheld the power of the mouse before. Was working for Disney World at the college program, and there were announcements for the special extra ticket even that night, a pirate-slash-princess party. The advertisements had pirates hamming it up and other such stuff. Really background noise for me at this point. Cleaning up an area, parents talking to their little kid who's crying trying to calm him down. I come up and ask what's wrong, and it turns out they surprised him with the extra tickets they were going to this, but he was scared because the pirates were going to be there, and he went off on other little kid fears. Well, hell. Some parents just pay an extra price for something a kid is absolutely terrified of doing, and there's no logic to it. So I go for my best superpower of BS. I crouch down and told the kid that in order to get into the Magic Kingdom, the pirates had to agree to a bargain created by Mickey that if they tried to do anything, they'd be magically cast out. (laughs) The kid believed me and is now super excited to go to the event. I didn't even have a costume character there to back me up on this or anything. I was just a frackin' custodian sweeping up dropped fries. 
but I worked there and invoked the mouse's name, and whatever I said was law, apparently. Parents were delighted. I was, frankly, kind of freaked out. That's a great one. I love it. Good for you. We just went for my seven-year-old's birthday. First time for all three of us, and I really appreciated how kind and fun all the staff were. Okay, but really, I like Disney movies, but my goodness, some people are so obsessed. As someone who lives in the Disney area, I 100% agreed. I thought it was all glimmering when I didn't live here and hadn't been. Now I think otherwise. Now I think otherwise? Looks like the mouse got them for the insolence. <laughs> Shh, they'll hear you. Do you want to bring it here? We in the Sunshine State are proud to host the mouse. Join us. The mouse is the reason our economy flourishes. There is a resistance. The mouse is the reason we have joy in our lives. Help us resist. The mouse is love. We have nearly all the cast members now within our ranks. The mouse is family. We're nearly ready for the revolution. The mouse is life. We just need more snacks. Even in Arizona, it's a six-hour drive, and I see Disney adults all the time. I go into five or eight strangers' homes each day for my job. So much Mickey Mouse. I'm laughing here, imagining that you don't go into strangers' homes for your job, but just as a hobby. Um, I think I like that part about this person invoking the mouse, telling the kid that the pirates had to make a deal that they wouldn't do anything. And I feel that that similar type of process happens when Disney deals with Ron DeSantis. Story three. Certain sports. College football in Alabama, for sure. Especially the Auburn-Alabama rivalry. It ended marriages before. My favorite was when the Bama fan shot and unalived another Bama fan for not being sad enough about losing the Iron Bowl. Or the Bama fan who poisoned the Oaks at Auburn and called into a sports radio station basically saying, I did it and I'm glad I did. Roll damn tide. He was a former police officer, too. He got beat up at a gas station near the courthouse in Opelika when he was on trial. According to the local police, the security camera footage from the gas station was accidentally deleted, so they never did find his assailant. I would argue that most professional sports are treated like religion. There's no England Premier League soccer this weekend because of the Queen's passing. All of my friends are bored and lost. SEC football is out of hand. College football in a lot of places, not just the South, though probably not the Northeast. I'm fascinated by the obsession with high school football in some areas. It's local football. It's biggest in places where people don't have access to higher level play. It's the biggest in Texas, which has access to every level of play imaginable. When I first moved to Tennessee, I was amused by the amount of orange everywhere. Hadn't lived anywhere else like it until I moved near the Georgia-Alabama border. I just realized I'm wearing orange. <laughs> the college wars are absolutely insane down here. It's one of the first things people ask you when they meet you before they ask your name. What football team you support, what church you go to, and then your name. When I went to Tennessee, I was shocked by all the cars with volunteer stickers and flags. Not being a sports fan, I honestly thought Tennessee was just the friendliest and most helpful state ever. I've heard stories of non-Americans visiting the U.S. and being weirded out about the amount of American flags. I wonder what they'd think walking into Knoxville and it just being fluorescent orange everything everywhere. There's probably an equal amount, if not more, UT flags. I can be visiting Arizona, and my eye will instantly catch the TNR purely because they can't leave the house not in orange. I'm an Aussie who went to a Vols game 20-plus years ago because I made friends with a guy from Knoxville when living in London. We're still friends. Had a great time. Still keep an eye on them, but they don't seem particularly great these days. Knoxville was a fun town. I drank a lot of beer, smoked a lot of pot, and got a hole-in-one playing frisbee golf. As a Florida fan can confirm, stuff's crazy, but sometimes it can be pretty damn fun.
As someone who drove to Gainesville on Saturday to watch the game, the key word is sometimes. Soccer slash football in Italy is basically the main religion, often more heartfelt than the actual church. I know, I wore orange for some reason. Uh, not this. I'm a gamer. I've never been a sports person at all, and I don't even know of the time where there was a match of StarCraft or League of Legends in a big arena that was one where people rioted and started tossing cars. Maybe we'll see it in our lifetime, but I don't know. I don't think so. What really sucked as a kid, but is fracking awesome as an adult? Story one, having absolutely nothing to do. It's pretty freeing, honestly. Gets tiring always needing something to do. I was laid off 15 years ago with three months severance pay, and it was fantastic. I had time to sleep and exercise and read and play video games, and I swear it was the best I felt mentally and physically since I was in high school. I have a friend who's semi-retirement, and I asked him what the best part was. He told me that it's not obligatory to enjoy your free time. When you only get two days off a week, you feel obligated to cram as much of your hobbies and entertainment into those two days as possible. At best, it stops feeling restful. At worst, the leisure activities become a chore and a source of stress themselves. Once you take work out of the equation, all that disappears and you can enjoy the things you enjoy at your own pace. It hit super hard for me because it was the first time my own feelings about my constantly busy weekends had been articulated so well. I was let go earlier this year, and one older co-worker told me to take some time off if my savings allowed, because next time you lose your job, you'll probably have kids and a mortgage. You'll never have a chance to just not work without stress again. Listening to him and my deity, it was amazing for about four months. Hogwarts Legacy had just come out. I'd been meaning to play Far Cry 6, had a bunch of books I had been pushing off reading. Then I started getting really bored, and my wife was getting driven crazy by me floating around the house like a toddler with nothing to do, so I finally went and got a new job. So yeah, doing nothing is glorious, but even now there's a limit. Yes, I took three years off, went to an island in Southeast Asia and tried to live the rest of my years in a bamboo hut. Didn't work out that way, but it was great for a while. That's so cool. I love Southeast Asia. I had a whole Chiang Mai Lantern Festival trip booked in 2020 before COVID happened. If I wasn't getting married two and a half months after this happened, I would have moved to Ireland where I have dual citizenship and done a similar thing. Just worked at a pub or something. I would love to move to Japan. Tokyo is my favorite place I've ever been because it's like another planet but I know I wouldn't do well there. It's expensive, and I don't speak the language at all. We all must return to reality at some point, I guess. As a current resident of Japan, you'd be amazed at how far you can get without speaking Japanese. I've picked up some in the last three years, but lots of pointing and smiling does the trick. Driving is the hardest part. A road sign will be flashing, and I have no idea what it's trying to tell me. I ended up doing that, but after a week, the guilt and self-loathing set in of being a useless, unemployed loser. I had flown over 100,000 miles the year before for my job, so it took longer for that to set in for me. It was actually being at my wedding slash honeymoon and feeling awkward when people asked what I was up to slash what I did for a living. I frackin' love being bored as an adult. I have ADHD, so being bored is like hell for me. However, I love having nothing important to do, like a day where I can just sit on my couch with snacks and my switch and not have to stress about anything. Same. It's like there's nothing I have to do, but I have plenty I can do. That is bliss. You mean optimizing efficiency by delaying the execution until a time when urgency and anxiety force an exceptional performance to wing it at the last moment? My wife likely has ADHD. She grew up poor, so was never diagnosed, but she has many of the symptoms. Also, she cannot sit still. There's been days where it's been a long work week, and I just want to veg out on the couch and read or 
watch a little TV or something. She can't do it. She can't sit still that long, and we have to be doing something. If it's not out adventuring or something, then it's cleaning the house. She doesn't force us to clean, of course, but you feel like a jerk if you're watching TV while she's mopping floors and stuff. I've been dealing with this for 20 years. I feel the same way about time off and doing stuff on my personal projects. I feel like I have to do something to move forward with it on my day off or days off. And if I don't do anything, then I feel like it's kind of wasted, even if I enjoyed myself just watching a TV show or something. Story two. I recently learned that it is adult swim time at my city pool that has a water slide. Oh, buddy, I got great news. Adult Swim is on every night on the Cartoon Network. I can already see the bump. A user online discovered the best thing about being an adult was Adult Swim. They were talking about their municipal pool, not us. We still love you, Adult Swim. Man, that makes me so nostalgic for OG Adult Swim and then Toonami. You can find entire chunks of Toonami and Adult Swim and other 20-year-old TV blocks that people TiVo'd or taped back in the day and uploaded to YouTube. It's weird. It'll just be a random four-hour chunk of Snick or something from some random night in 1993, complete with the bumps in Circuit City and Time Life Pure Moods commercials and everything. Literally Adult Swim. As a child, I was ticked, like, whose stupid butt idea was this? As an adult, I relish an adult swim. Fifteen sweet, sweet minutes of quiet bliss to just swim around. It's also somewhat of a break for lifeguards. There's still someone on duty, and you still have to yell at kids for running and stuff, but not having to watch a crowded pool full of small, flailing bodies gives the eyeballs time to recharge. I think primarily it's a safety break for the kids who might continue swimming until exhaustion if they were not required to get out of the pool for those 15 minutes. I know they run around and do other stuff during adult swim. I was a lifeguard and eventually a pool manager for seven years, but just getting out of the pool helps them reset. I told my wife I wanted to start trying for a kid so that I can have an excuse to go on the water slide and not look like a weirdo. All the kids were watching me, which felt weird. Then two of them were like, Sir, we've never seen someone go that fast. How did you do it? So I found myself bestowing water slide wisdom to two up-and-comers, which felt odd because it unlocked a memory of my dad explaining how to dive off a diving board to some kids when I was younger. How can you write that comment and walk away without giving us those sweet, fast-sliding nuggets of wisdom? <clears throat> Arms across the chest and legs crossed at the ankle straight as a pencil. The trick is to really just have your heels and shoulder blades make contact while arching your back. Zooming time. Friction and air resistance reduction. Makes sense. Very clever. Keep your trunks off the slide. They create a lot of drag and slow you down. And if you try it naked to reduce drag, you'll get thrown out. Maybe thrown in jail, too. I felt this way about adult skate time if I ever went out roller skating. It was a time that I now realized was to take a break. And I needed it because I always went hard during roller skating and I always ended up with blisters no matter how closely the skates that I got fit. Story three. Life in general. I was picked on all through high school and home wasn't much better. I'm always bewildered by adults who wish to be kids again. No thank you. You couldn't pay me enough to go back to any point in my life before I left for college. They had nice childhoods. Yep. I have a friend who wished he could go back to high school and asked if I'd go back if I could. I'm like, that's because you're a golden boy, man. You got good looks, are highly athletic, and are naturally intelligent with a good family. He kind of looked confused until I told him about my time in high school, getting botched with, struggling to focus on my academics because it was so damn boring, and I'm naturally super thin and not the best good looking. He seemed to understand after that, oddly enough. I think I liked my 30s the best. Teens and 20s were all 
dermatitis, stress, and anxiety. I could pour myself into my studies because it helped me not dwell on how awful life was. Ditching the anxiety made everything else work a bit better. I wish I could go back to school. I was so carefree. Like what? Exams? Classes? Bullies? Puberty? Being the poor kid? Studying stuff you hated? Etc. Who wants that back? I don't want to go back, but I get it. I am responsible right now for keeping several other humans fed and housed, among other things. I have a mortgage and other things to pay for. I must have a job, and I must do it well enough to keep my bosses happy. It can be stressful sometimes, and it's easy to look back with a bit of nostalgia to a time when all these things were someone else's problem. I wasn't even picked on. I was definitely one of the more popular kids, and I got along with most everyone. With that being said, I hated school. I viewed it like a prison, except I got to go home at the end of the day. I hated not having any choices. I hated waking up before sunrise to catch the bus. I was bored out of my mind at school. Being a kid was trash. I'm almost 30 now. I have a nice apartment and make good money at a job I don't mind going to. I go out with friends all the time. Life is the best it's ever been, and I wouldn't go back for anything. Seriously, people say the same thing to me. I think about the hell that was school. I was actually self-unaliving because of it, and even on my better days, I was counting down the days until I turned 17 and could drop out and not even my parents could force me to go anymore. As an adult, I have a smeggy job where I'm abused, but I can go to HR, which probably wouldn't do a damn thing, or to an employment lawyer, which might get results, or just simply quit, and I've done all three. Quitting is the most satisfying, although you have to have your finances in order to do that. I don't miss that period, but I miss how I felt, the things I thought about. I swear there's a journal entry from my high school years that starts, I woke up today and the sky was really blue and I felt happy to be alive. Like what? Yeah, give me that just one more time. I also miss discovering music as a teen. It felt so poignant and life-changing. Now it's fine and cool, but not the same. Part of me wants to go, would like to go back to being a kid, to go through all that, knowing what I know now. I was an outcast. I was the weird kid. I was bullied a lot. But I tried to care. I tried to make friends and everything. Now I know I'm weird. I probably go through all the same thing. But I wouldn't give a care to anyone at all. I'd just like to go through what I went through again with that kind of an attitude and see how things end up. I think that would be a cool experiment. If someone gave you $1,000 and said you must use this to buy a gift for yourself, what would you buy? Story 1. A year's worth of massages. My local place does a package deal. Ooh, good idea. Package deals are my favorite kind of massages. Down at the old Jack Shack. How many massages is a year's worth of massages? Depends. A few times a year is a lot for me, but I have not gotten on in years. My wife had never gone for one until last year. Once every few months seems like a lot to me. We went to Thailand recently. A 90-minute massage was around 300 baht, $9 on the higher end, uh, so $15 would make a great tip. I would do that every week. Holy hell, I'd have those people working so much. <laughs> when I go to Indonesia, I usually get at least one a day at about 10 US dollars, plus the occasional foot massage and body scrub. It's like heaven on earth for two weeks. Okay, I haven't even read any of the other answers, but that's now my answer too. In this vein, but different. I wonder if hot tubs could be found for this price. All feel good about massage, but with the benefits of not having to leave the house or get dressed. A used one, maybe, probably, depending on your area. But having worked with this kind of thing before, you do not want the used hot tub. Too many, probably, most owners will not take care of them the way they need to 
and they can become a major mechanical pain in the tool to just super fracking nasty in the pump, filter, and the system. Now you can get a brand new inflatable one for around $500 to $600 delivered right to your door for free if you have Prime. I bought one about a year ago and it's one of my prized possessions. No one else is allowed to use it. Only me and my delicious fruity drinks. I've been saving up to get a PS5 in this sweet hot tub I found in Costco that's only around $400. It has bubbles and everything. It would be perfect for this upcoming fall and winter season. I heard that being in a hot tub during the cold or snow is fine because the heat kind of creates a temperature bubble or something like that, like how an igloo doesn't melt with a fire inside. Yeah, it's pretty much like that. You can even enjoy them in the heat of summer, believe it or not. Just don't stay in too long. Gotta watch your body's temperature and don't stay in long enough to let it get too high. But hot tubs are absolutely amazing. There is nothing more relaxing after a hard day's work, in my opinion. A hot tub and a cold drink is always guaranteed to make my tired old bones happy. I highly recommend it. And also, don't get lazy on taking proper care of it. Read all the material on how to keep it clean and well-maintained. That's very important. There's now inflatable hot tubs that you can get on Amazon or Walmart for like $600. I could have put it right in the middle of my third floor hotel room during the extended stay I'm at and watch TV. Right next to the bed. <laughs> Can confirm. Inflatable hot tubs work. My friends and I bought one during COVID for $400. It could heat up to 104 Fahrenheit with the lid on and then would drop after the lid came off. Sometimes we just huddled under the lid if it was cold outside so we could keep the temperature up. We get crazy good at tub chemistry, bromine levels, pH, etc., after one minor skin rash outbreak where we let bromide levels get too low for too long. But we're a bunch of legitimate professional chemists, so maybe we should have known better. The tub had two rules. One, excreting liquids and solids were not accepted. Farts were allowed. Two, there was always room for one more person in the tub. We once got 14 people in a 6-foot diameter hot tub. Best $400 we spent ever. Don't know about the inflatable hot tubs, but I have been to Thailand and I can tell you about getting massages, legitimate massages out there. They are that cheap, and for as long as you live there, you could get one every week or even more, and they are very thorough. It's just very thorough, and it is very relaxing. I would highly recommend it. Story 2. Plane ticket and a weekend hotel stay. To where? Ukraine is nice this time of year. You remind me of this guy, the one who visits a country after a natural disaster or terrorist attack so that it's cheaper. The first time I went to Disneyland, a trip that had been planned for months, was on October 11th, 2001. Every line was less than 10 minutes long. I went on September 13th, 2001, to Disney World and can confirm. It was magical. I also remember everyone was so nice to each other. It's truly one of my favorite memories of the goodness that humans can show, even in the face of a terrible tragedy. I remember a few years ago in my country, a guy shot up a tram and unalived four people. First messages were coming out. It was a terrorist attack and the guy was Muslim. We lived in the city center back then, and I remember so vividly the kindness between the people in the street, Muslims and otherwise. It was as if we were trying to tell each other, we know this isn't you or what you're about, without actually speaking the words. I know some people will disagree with the sentiment, but it was a very powerful and wonderful feeling for me at that time. Just people choosing to not be divided in spite of horrible things happening and standing together. My family had a trip to Hawaii scheduled for just after 9-11, September 15th. We were flying from O'Hare to L.A. We spent like three nights there and then on to Maui and then Honolulu. The planes were practically empty. We each got an entire row to ourselves. We each lay down across the seats and slept most of the way. The hotels were nearly empty, so we got free upgrades to the penthouse suites at each destination. 
It was the best vacation we ever had. Edit. I seem to have mixed up the dates. Edit 2. We flew out of O'Hare on Sunday, September 16th. My hubby is taking me on a surprise anniversary trip this weekend, and I keep asking if it's to Russia for the real war experience and then life insurance collection for him. I'm Ukrainian, so don't downvote me for my dark sense of humor. I experienced something similar on my flights, I think, last year, shortly after covid I flew home from Thailand to visit my mom and then back, and it was practically empty, and it was just like that. This was a 13-hour flight. Even in economy, everybody had their own row, and everybody just slept, lifted up the armrest and slept on that flight, just laid across the whole rows. It was really the best economy experience I've ever had. Story three. A $1,000 Amazon gift certificate. Don't rush me. Years and years ago at my company, we all hit a super high goal, and everyone was given the option of a $500 Amazon gift card or $500 on their paycheck. Needless to say, everyone got the Amazon gift card so we wouldn't have to pay taxes on it. The finance department was ticked since they still had to pay taxes, and they made it a rule that Amazon gift cards could not exceed $20 before saying no more Amazon cards a few months later. Edit. For everyone saying I should have been taxed, you are correct. The company messed up. I don't remember the specifics, but the boss just threw it on a company card and didn't tell anyone. Finance had to figure out the taxes. Never showed up on my W-2. Either way, they had to pay taxes on it, so they got mad that their employees were smart and took the tax-free route? What the hell? I don't remember the specifics, but I think it's because of how they did the gift cards. Basically, Bossman bought them from a company, CC, and handed them out, but it was never reported on our W-2, so the company ended up having to cover the income tax on it or something like that. It was some tax thing where they went well over budget and on bonuses because of the Amazon cards. Yep, they gave us 500 Amazon gift cards for Christmas last year with a note saying this counts as income and taxes will be taken out of the following check. I wish they would have just given us a 500 bonus on our check instead of forcing us to use Amazon. Finance department lacks imagination. They should have classified the payment as a contribution to the company cafeteria plan and the Amazon gift cards as cash payments paid in lieu of benefits. Cafeteria plan contributions are excluded from taxable income, so are cash payments made in lieu of the benefit. I guess this company just was not as creative as this person about trying to figure out the best way to give bonuses to people. But yeah, I think last year I had uh, a gift of a very extravagant Amazon gift card, and I definitely utilized it, so I was glad that that happened. Definitely could recommend if you have that, or just receiving the same amount of money that you still have to pay taxes on. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. What is the worst reason to have a baby? Why? Story 2. To save the relationship. It never works. It just drags an innocent baby into a miserable situation. This is more common than people think. I have to wonder if anyone anywhere ever have actually improved a relationship by having a child. I'm sure some have managed to extend the life of a troubled relationship by adding a baby to the mix. But improving the relationship? Making it a relationship worth staying in? I don't see that happening. Well, it would have helped Henry VIII. I think you have to specify a son in this situation. But yeah, imagine if Catherine of Aragon had a son or two. Henry might just be a blip on the radar of English monarchs without all the fuss and bother of six wives, etc. But then we wouldn't have had Elizabeth I, and that makes me a little sad. Yeah, he probably wouldn't have needed to create the Church of England either. Imagine an alternate history where the coin hits tails and Henry VIII got his son. Suddenly, Catholicism probably gets a century more to reign in England, maybe even stopping the Thirty-Year War from ever happening.
Imagine if Catherine of Aragon had a son or two, or rather, if Henry VIII's sperm had produced a son. He did have one with Jane Seymour. Marrying after that would have been for the spare. Since Henry himself was the younger son, he'd know how needed that was. He also had one or two illegitimate sons. And given Edward wasn't the healthiest of kids, it was prudent to try and get a spare. We didn't have a bad relationship before, but it's definitely made our relationship stronger. A lot of other factors have played into that, though. My wife was miserable at work, which was bleeding into our relationship. Then when she got pregnant, she realized that there are so many things in life more important than work, and she generally just became happier. She also realized that drinking alcohol and coffee were both making her feel worse constantly, and she gave those up during pregnancy and stayed off for good, and I joined her. That made our relationship stronger because we realized so much of our relationship we were both just miserable, then would drink after work and complain about work, and then need coffee in the morning because we were hung over. It probably wouldn't have fixed a bad relationship, but it certainly improved ours a bit. I think it's born of people incorrectly thinking that not getting divorced is saving the relationship, and so many terrible, miserable people stay together for the kids. My divorced aunt once told me, being happily married for 15 years makes for a more successful marriage than being unhappily married for 50. She's friends with her ex to this day, and she's currently on successful marriage number two. I actually know a couple that was going to break up, 18, and she found out she was pregnant. 18 years later, they have five kids and are genuinely just delightful together. I would tend to agree there are outliers, it sounds like the people in the main part of this topic were talking about other external issues that the baby sort of helped them do, like quitting alcohol, realizing there's more in life, and all of that. But just putting all that pressure on a baby to save a marriage, I would agree that most times that's just not going to work out. If you're awful before, adding someone else to the mix is really not going to help in the long run, usually. Story 3. To use it as content on social media. This is my baby, Bailey. She's spelled B-E-I-G-E-L-E-I-G-H. Oh. She's my favorite now that Roxin, R-O-X-Y-N-N, is two and throws tantrums that don't fit my aesthetic. It's my baby, Bailey. A family friend recently joked that she was going to name her son Bob, as in B-A-W-B. -B. <laughs> I'm stealing Bob for my next Sims name. Bob, Bob A. B-O-G-H-B-E-I-G-H. That boy definitely ain't right. And the, that aesthetic is four different shades. Eggshell white, taupe, beige, and light olive. Oh, there are so few things I hate more than sad beige baby trend. I'm a lover of all things colorful anyway, but it just seems cruel to do that to a developing baby. When my preteen son was a baby, and to this day, I've always kept his environment, clothes, etc. colorful. I have zero scientific data to back it, but I always thought more colors would equal more curiosity about the world. I don't know. I'm going to dress my baby like a damn circus clown and no one can stop me. Not sarcasm, I actually do love bright colors. Agreed. If I remember correctly, there was some evidence recently published that it's actively harmful since it inhibits babies' abilities to distinguish between colors. Let me see if I can find more info. Edit. Found a Wired article from 2021 with doctors quoted as saying it's not necessarily harmful, but definitely not optimal. There's some evidence quoted in a study of babies born in the Arctic winter versus autumn showing decreased color sensitivity, but there isn't enough data to make a good judgment. There's a URL link again. I'm not going to say the whole thing. Honestly, though, this happens. The one thing that comes to mind is a couple adopting a young kid from Indonesia, I think. They were well into the process when the adoption agency found them and saw that they had a social media presence where they gave updates to their followers on the process. The agency told them 
that they have a policy where within a year of adoption, the adopters are not permitted to post the child on social media or make any specific comments regarding the child. Instead of being reasonable people, they simply canceled the adoption process entirely. It is truly borderline evil, especially since they just wanted an adopted kid for clout and couldn't wait a year. It's disturbing how parents don't understand their role is to protect their kids, but have done the opposite when they're posting their kids to possibly dangerous people. I used to watch this girl on YouTube who talked about makeup and clothes and just lifestyle stuff. The second she got pregnant slash had a baby, her parents were, Day in the life of a toddler mama, top five best toddler products, spend the day with me and my toddler, shoving the camera in the baby's face in every video. Blocked. I think that's just the evolution of people that are stage parents or people that push kids into the entertainment industry. We're starting to see a lot more new information about how kids were forced into this kind of stuff now that a lot from Me Too to a lot of the protests to a lot of the Weinstein stuff coming out, you're seeing a lot more of that out in the open. And just this is just the social media version of it now where you're seeing that come out. It's every bit as dangerous. Story 4. To Sell Them Daughters are being sold into child marriage and sons are sold for forced child labor in many countries. Or adoption mills. I know someone who was adopted from a Central American country about 20 years ago. Wonderful little girl. When the girl was about 13 or 14, she discovered that she had at least four siblings who had also been adopted as babies and were living in the U.S. Makes you wonder. It gets so much worse. After adolescence, girls began to have psychotic episodes. Turns out that she had lived in a nursery much of the first year in her life and was completely neglected. Yes, that blows up on people at some point. She's now in an institution. In Cambodia in the 80s and 90s, there was an elaborate network of adoption mills working with the authorities that resulted in the kidnapping of a huge amount of children. The corruption was exposed all the way up the ladder. Really horrible. Edit. If anyone wants to read up on the subject, Cambodia's Curse is a great book. Similar thing happened in Israel a long while back. Read up on the Yemenite children affair. My great aunt's sister was a victim. They were Jewish Yemeni and fled Yemen when my aunt was a baby to escape anti-Semitism. But in Israel, they were oppressed for being Yemeni, so there was no winning. The Israeli government stole Yemeni Jewish babies and adopted them out to white Jewish families. Government only admitted to it as recently as 2016. My aunt is an old woman now and has no living blood family that she knows of. I'm related to her through marriage. Her stolen sister and any descendants she may have had are probably out there somewhere, but they will never know each other. It's very sad. Racism destroys so many families. This is the worst reason of all. In Western countries, it's nowhere near the same, but people who keep having kids hoping to get their preferred gender are also pretty bad. We finally got our boy at baby number six. Like, congrats? You had four kids in the interim you technically didn't want that you admit you only had as filler. Yeah, I heard of a couple who did that. I think it was literally their sixth kid they finally got the boy. There's no way they were going to be treating all six of their kids equally. The girls will be treated less than and they'll know it. It also makes me think of that gender reveal video where the dad is so excited about a boy that he shakes the ever-loving smeg out of his baby daughter. My mom's cousin did this. Wanted a boy and didn't get one till number five. Then they had two more for a total of seven. The way they raise those kids isn't the best either. They homeschool and keep them out of extracurriculars unless it's work they're getting paid for. They're very unexposed to people, and their oldest one is already following in her parents' footsteps. Not to mention a rocky relationship between the parents. It's sad because I remember when they were younger, there were times those kids would come to me sobbing because they wanted to go to school or join a dance club and make friends, but their parents said no. Such a weird control dynamic. What was your, it can't be that easy, it was that easy moment in your life? Story 1. Found a 60-inch TV by the dumpster. Plugged it in. Didn't turn on. Looked up common problems with the model number. Bought a part on eBay for $20. Replaced the part. And had a huge TV. Edit. 
Wow, this is many upvotes. I didn't even know these places gave trophies for best comment slash day, and I'm kind of confused why I got it for fixing a TV. Anyways, so fun to hear about everyone's similar experiences. Let's all keep fixing Smeg that turns out to be $20 or less with minimal effort for not being Smeg. I was given a TV because the audio didn't work. On the back was a sound on off button. Back in the late 80s, my grandmother gave me her old 13-inch black and white TV because she wanted to upgrade to color. I was excited because having a TV in my room was awesome. I was even more excited when I turned the color adjust knob up and the black and white TV that she'd had for 20 years was suddenly colored. She was not such a fan of this revelation. She'd had it for so long she'd gotten used to the black and white and forgotten about its color functionality. I had a GBA SP-101 received as a Christmas present when it came out for over a year before I realized it wasn't using the brighter backlit light because I'd never touched the button. When I was a kid, we used to regularly dumpster dive for electronics. The vast majority of electronics are thrown away because some minor part is broken. Oftentimes, it's as simple as a fuse. Learn how to use a multimeter and do basic soldering and you'll be able to do a ton of home repairs. Update. People keep asking me where to learn this stuff. YouTube is your best friend. Big Clive is my go-to. Also a channel called Joe's Classic Video Games where I learn so much about tracing down faults. There's also a dozen warnings about learning how to discharge capacitors. You should follow them as they can unalive you. But luckily, the method to discharge them is really simple. Start small, practice on things you don't mind breaking, you'll definitely break things, and don't frack with microwave ovens. Seriously, call an expert. Pretty much, my dryer quit working one day and turned out to be the door switch that let the dryer know the door was closed. Part was something like two ninety five dollars instead of having to buy a $600 dryer. My mother still has the same washer my parents purchased when I was a toddler. That washer is now almost 40 years old. If it broke, my dad fixed it. It stopped working last summer, and I took it upon myself to repair it since my dad isn't around anymore. It was a $26 coupler. Buying a new washer with all the fancy electronic components that has to be fixed by some technician just seems irresponsible to me now. Even modern washers are mostly repairable. The brain box is self-contained, and most failures are in the mechanical pieces that simply wear out, like pumps. I repaired my washing machine when the bearings went off, but in the process discovered that the spider arm that supports the drum was corroded through. Replacements weren't available for less than the cost of a new washing machine, and I couldn't afford the time to search for a broken machine with a compatible one, see if it was in better condition, etc., especially since the disassembly to access it took hours. It only lasted another few months before it went bang, rattle, 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 and that was it. But at least I tried, and at least I fixed the original issue. Come to think of it, the selector dial had broken years prior to that, so I cut the circuit board traces and soldered wires on, then soldered a new rotary encoder on and glued it to the top of the machine. Took maybe an hour in a $5 part versus replacing the board for over $400. So actually, it had already had a second life even before the bearings failed. Lesson learned. If you ever wash a disposable nappy in your washing machine by accident, you should completely disassemble it and clean it. The corrosion was mostly due to those awful jelly crystals stuck in the corners of the spider arm. Also, ew. I once saw college freshmen throw a whole mini fridge into the dumpster. I was so shocked that I couldn't even react to stop them from throwing the fridge and taking it for myself. I was an international student in the U.S., and that made me realize that I had become a bit wasteful since staying in the U.S. I threw out, well, didn't dumpster it, but left it outside my room, my mini-fridge after sophomore year in the dorms. But I had gotten it from someone else who left it outside their room on move-out, 
so I just did the same thing and figured someone else would appreciate the free mini-fridge as I had. Who knows how many owners that mini-fridge has had by now. I tried fixing a mini-fridge in my dorm room. Hand got pinned between the back plate and a capacitor. Didn't know how long I was there, but my then-girlfriend, now wife, opened the door, which hit me free. She asked me what was I cooking. I said, me, lay down and went to sleep for 18 hours straight. Would not recommend it. If you ever find yourself in that situation again, do not go to sleep. Go to the emergency room for an ECG. I once helped my mom figure out what the problem with the dryer was because it wasn't drying that well. Wasn't anything to do with the machine at all. Had to take the machine out, borrow uh, something from a friend, this huge wire from a friend, and just clear out the chute that goes up to the roof and out. It was clogged with so much lint and gunk. You have no idea. It was so gross, but it worked better than ever. Story two. In college, the professor advertised an internship and wrote the info on the board. Out of a class of 150 students, I was the only one to apply, and I fulfilled my internship requirements for graduation. I did something similar as an extern. They did a survey asking for placement, and I was the only one who selected advertisement. Nice gig. The first Thor movie. Dr. Selby. You should know this stuff. You're a science intern. Darcy. Political science. Jane. She was the only one who applied. By the time she made it, WandaVision, though. Government-level hacker, evidently. And she'd completed her PhD in astrophysics. A lot can happen to someone in ten years. I feel like meeting an alien god would be excellent motivation for a career change into astrophysics. It says here on your resume that you have hands-on experience? Well, technically, I was in the passenger seat when the truck hit him. All the students pretty much bombed a networking final. Teacher said we could retake it, but we would be alone, no group. Which worked out perfectly for me. They wouldn't get in my way, and I wouldn't have to coordinate them. I was also the only person who showed up to retake, brought my final grade up to a 90. I showed up to senior skip day in high school during my last year because I was unfortunately close to not passing two of my needed electoral classes for graduation. It had been strongly rumored that any students that showed up would get dumb work and some sort of extra test for bonus points and a grade or two. Most of my classmates weren't there that day, so it felt like a study hall all day. It was about the easiest work and essay test I had taken in years. I cried when my teachers told me I'd bumped my overall grade in their respective classes to a C- and I was no longer in the questionable area of possibly not graduating that year. Over 1.5K upvotes? Thank you all. Holy cow, appreciate the upvotes. I didn't expect this comment to get as popular as it did, Appreciate all the support messages from folks. It means a lot. To the haters in my DM, don't be surprised if you get blocked. Just wanted to share a life experience I had, nothing more. Thank you. I went to school on senior skip day, various parental reasons, and my shop teacher decided to have a pop quiz for the day. He would say your name, and if you replied, you got an A. Microsoft came to our college to seek interns, C.S., only two applied. Both got the job. Believing in yourself is important. I did this for my girlfriend all the time, but for scholarships. She didn't realize most scholarships aren't even applied for, so they give it to whoever applies to it by default. With her help, I wrote four essays that were tweaked for each scholarship application. I did the writing because I'm a writer by trade. By the time she transferred to her new college, she had an excess of 1500 to spend every month. Because of that, she could focus on her studies full-time instead of trying to balance a job as well. Managed to get a scholarship in a country where most scholarships disallow having concurrent ones. My university has an entire office staff dedicated to helping you apply, and it seems to be a service barely used by the students. No idea why. A two-page application is all it takes in most cases, and they can net you thousands of euros over the years. Man, how I'd love to just apply to all of them. 
I think that one is the big takeaway for this video, especially with uh, possibly not getting debts forgiven. I think just having to search out every opportunity you can. It's unfortunate that you probably have to study as much to get a decent deal on a college education than having to study on the subjects that you're wanting to study in anyway. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.